Well, welcome to uh, Cocktail Party Economic Conversations. Uh, we're looking at the concept of value, and uh, value turns out to be a fairly emotional issue, and I'm really, really excited to have Matt Downey as our guest today. Thanks for being here. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me. Hi, Matt. Uh, yeah, so um, so you prefer Matt or Matthew? Matt is great, yeah. Yeah, Matt? Okay. So, yeah, I, I'm looking at your LinkedIn. It says you are a Toronto Chartered Business Valuator. That's right. So that's the valuator. That's it. Was like valuator. Like, like a <laughs> sounds terminator. like a word. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's that's interesting. So, uh, where our conversation is all about value and and stuff like that. So, tell me a little bit about what you do and your role and how you go about your role. Like, in simple terms that I can understand it, and like Evie will probably understand it, but you know, in a layman's terms. And then after that, you can just tell us about your journey from the University of Guelph to where you are now. Sure. So as you said, I'm a chartered business valuator, and uh, that is a, a professional designation that is uh, given out by the Canadian Institute of Chartered Business Valuators. Uh, within Canada, there's probably somewhere around 2,000 uh, what we will call CBVs in, in Canada and around the world, I guess. Um, so it's a small niche. Um, a lot of CBVs are actually uh, also accountants. Uh, myself, I'm a chartered professional accountant, uh, but you don't have to be. There's uh, people with diverse backgrounds who find their way into this line of work. So you guys go by CBVs? Yeah. It's a little bit close to CB, CB, <laughs> CBD or <laughs> CBD. Yeah, CBD. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's the kind of the terminology that gets thrown around, especially like in the legal world in which in which I work. So, um, what we do in a nutshell is um, there's all kinds of situations out there where someone may own a private business, and, and when I say private, I mean it's not publicly traded on the stock exchange. It's just a, you know a business that they own uh, either themselves or with a small group of other shareholders. And uh, they may need to know what the value of that business is. And so unlike public uh, companies where you can look it up on Yahoo Finance or, or whatever your favorite uh, website is, with private businesses, there's really no way to, to kind of test the market to see what your business might be worth. So in those situations, uh, charter business valuators are used to uh, come up with what we call a notional value. So that means it's not you know, a real open market value, but it's, you know, in a, in a kind of theoretical world where th that business were put up for sale, what do we think the, the value of that business would be? So um, the most typical situations where that's required uh, are, well, there's a, there's a bunch actually, but the ones I work in are um, in litigation. So let's say we have a, a married couple and one or both of them are shareholders of a, of a business and uh, things unfortunately uh, don't go well for them and they decide to separate and then eventually divorce, they're going to need to know what the value of that, that business is so that they can include that in the, the list of all their assets, you know, the, the home that they live in, the car that they have, uh, everything else, and divide everything up equally. So um, that's one area where we, we often get involved. Another one is just that must be depressing. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's um, it's a kind of a challenging line of work. Uh, some people uh, avoid it for that reason. Um, it can be depressing, certainly. Uh, it's just totally dependent on the situation. You know, some people handle these things very well. You know, they've already kind of moved on in a lot of other aspects of their life, and they're just trying to figure out the financial aspect of it. Um, other people are caught up in all kinds of other issues yeah. that go along with, with separation and divorce, uh, issues with the kids, uh, you know, who did what and who wronged who. So in those kinds of situations, it can get, get a little bit uh, more challenging. Um, but I think it's kind of cool to have that like expertise in valuing business, right? It actually does simplify the process or the fight, right? And if you have experts who can like do, do typically people hire their own business valuators or are you, yeah, uh, like each well, side of in dispute? Yeah, so it can go a, a number of different ways. Uh, the most uh, typical situation is um, that 
you know, each side, if you want to call it that, uh, will hire mm-hmm. evaluator and they'll, they'll each, well, uh, before that happens, often one side hires evaluator, they'll prepare a report and uh, that report will be served to the other side, which shows the conclusion of value. The other side will either say, okay, that seems pretty reasonable. Let's use that. Or they'll say, no, we don't agree with that. And if they can't negotiate something from there, then they'll hire their own evaluator to come up with a number. So it sounds like, you know, each evaluator would be incentivized to just come up with the best number for their client in that kind of situation, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're involved in litigation, uh, the duty of a business evaluator as, as an independent expert is actually to the court and not to the party that hires you. So my duty is to provide objective evidence to the court as to the value of this business. So should this matter proceed to trial, um, my report will be served. I could be uh, up in the witness box providing expert witness testimony to the, to the court. And my uh, evidence has to be impartial and helpful to the court. And if there's any whiff of me manipulating the numbers in the favor of my client, then my my evidence will be given very little, if any weight, and my reputation will be will be torn. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask, what do you you like? I mean, now you're you're valuing a business, so you're trying to say this is what it's worth, and but you like it's not like real estate where you know someone will come in and say, hey, you know, you're looking at putting your house out for sale. Here are the comparables. Like businesses typically don't have like comparables, do they? Or how how do you actually value uh, a business? Like on inventory or what do you do? It's like a lot of my answers today. It it depends. And there's a few different ways. Um, So you're right. Within Canada, especially, it's hard to get um, good comparative information for similar types of businesses that have sold. The reason being that these are uh, private companies that sell in the private market and there's no uh, no reason and nothing compelling buyers and sellers to actually compel or excuse me to actually uh, disclose the terms of their their deal. So you may hear that you know someone sold their business but you really have no way of finding out what the terms were, what the price was uh, unless they for some reason f- feel like sharing that with you. That being said, there is some uh, databases out there where some limited amount of information is available from, you know, business brokers and intermediaries who have disclosed, you know, on a confidential basis, um, the terms of the deal. So we do look to those databases when we can to benchmark uh, mostly uh, our other calculations just to see if we're in the the realm of of reasonability. But but the way we normally do it is... um, by looking at the the earnings of the business, uh, so value in, when you're looking at valuing a business, value is perspective. Value is totally dependent on what's going to happen in the future. What's happened in the past uh, is sometimes a, a decent indicator of what might happen in the future, but to a, bu- a buyer of that business, it's largely irrelevant. They want to know what's going to happen in the future. So we look at trying to estimate what the cash flows to be derived from that business will be in the future. And then we need to attach um, some sort of risk measurement of, of how risky those cash flows are. So in a very mature, stable business that is expected to continue on as it has, uh, the risk might be relatively low, in which case uh, you would be willing to pay a higher multiple of you know one year's earnings or whatever Right. Uh, to acquire that business because you're reasonably assured that eventually you're going to make your money back and then you're going to pof- profit the profits from then on out. In a riskier business, maybe a startup or something that's, you know, very or competitive. COVID. Like what do you do in COVID? Yeah. Um, and it, well, COVID's a, a separate situation, so I can go right. into that. But 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 if it's a riskier business, you, you want to, uh, you know, attach a lower multiple typically because if there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether the uh, the seller is going to be able to or sorry the buyer is going to be able to recoup their investment with covid we're, we're in a very interesting time right now because um, quite often what we do is, is we look back at say the last five years of operations to say okay 
is this indic indicative of what the future cash flows are going to be? And if, you know, we make a few adjustments, but typically our expectations are that the business is going to continue on as it has for the most part. But with COVID, we know that in most cases, the last few years, there's not indicative of what's going to happen in, in at least the next couple going forward. Yeah. So in those situations, you have to, um, we use what's called a discounted cash flow analysis, which is a fancy term, but essentially we're just uh, discreetly year by year estimating what we think the cash flows are for that year. So we have to kind of build out a model that, that says, okay, uh, in the next year, we think revenues are going to be X. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's like a percentage reduction from what they were over the past five years on average, or, you know, maybe management has some, some other way of estimating what they think their revenues will be. But we just have to go year by year. Okay, revenue, uh, you know, how are the expenses going to be affected by COVID? And then how, so how is profit going to be affected? And we'll just do that year by year until at some point we have to make the assumption that they're going to make it back to like their sort of set steady state. And then in that, mm -hmm. once we've done that, we can um, just finish the calculation by coming up with what's called a terminal value. So, mm -hmm. you know, if that business continues on, indefinitely into the future you know what is that stream of, okay. of cash flow yeah work? i was going to ask you like like value of, as of when is it a future looking thing you know um yeah that type of thing yeah so uh we always make sure we find out at the very beginning of an assignment what our valuation date is so mm -hmm. it can really be any date um it depends on the situation. So in divorces, uh, you've typically got two potential valuation dates. You've got in Ontario anyways, it differs by province, but um, in Ontario, you've got the date of marriage uh, and you've got the date of separation. So because of the way the, the law around divorce works in Ontario, you know, in general, you keep what you brought into the marriage and you share what was acquired during the marriage. So if you had a business uh, before you got married, then you're entitled to uh, keep the value of that business uh, that you brought into the marriage. But then you have to also value it at, value it at the date of separation because any growth uh, in the business during the marriage gets shared between the two parties. So that can be... You know, are people go, getting divorced now because their business valuations are lower? Like this could be a real <laughs> snotty thing that people do is yeah. they kind of manipulate... You're not a divorce lawyer. <laughs> I, well, no, I, I know, but I'm just thinking like, I mean... If you married yeah. somebody and they brought a business in that was very successful and now it's valued at less because, you know, COVID has happened, mm. they would walk away with nothing, but you're still going to keep the business or whatever. And, and it could grow again. like, honestly, yeah. wow. It's, it could be a consideration, you know, I, I don't know if I'd be that cynical to say that's what people are doing, but, uh, but certainly it's possible if people put two and two together and say, you know, I've been trying to get out of this or I've been wanting to get out of this marriage for a long time. This is an opportune time where I can uh, come away with a little more of the, the pie than I would normally then. Um, so I was just going to ask you, does, do you get, um, the, do the courts require more disclosure from the parties um, for you to get more information? Like, um, is there a requirement that they release certain information to you? Yeah. Yeah. So we work very closely with the lawyers. Uh, so we, when we get an assignment, we'll start everything off by preparing an information request list and uh, we'll provide that. And depending on the situation, sometimes people just willingly disclose everything and work with us quite cooperatively uh, in other circumstances, they don't, in which case the lawyers then need to, go to court and try and get a court order for the disclosure. Cool. So really this business evaluation area is very um, kind of formal. It's a very formal uh, kind of business where there's a lot of paper trail documents, keeping records. Um, In a litigation setting. Yeah. There, there's other engagements that aren't as formal though. Um, for instance, we do a lot of, I work in an accounting firm, so we do a lot of work uh, in connection with uh, income tax reorganizations. So people want to change the way their share capital is set up and they want to try and uh, typically pass on the future growth of a corporation to uh, the younger generation. Mm -hmm. So they, they may um, set up a, 
a situation where they're changing the share capital, giving shares to kids or giving shares to a family trust. And so the, according to the CRA, all that stuff has to be done at uh, fair market value. You can't just come up with a value and, and use mm-hmm. it. So um, we'll get hired to to help with that. And and those are they're less formal because the clients are coming to us. They're not involved in litigation. They just have a, uh, a need for our services. So we can work closely with them and we send them a list and they're usually much more cooperative and they don't have often the the background distractions going on that people who are getting divorced or who are in a shareholder dispute or some other uh, you know legal problem will have so well so it's probably uh they're trying to do something nice for their kids right they're they're probably initiating it. it's not the kids that are initiating it's the parents saying hey i want to figure out how to you know have a little more time and how to pass it on to kids and they've built up this business and their children may be involved, but they have some kids who aren't involved. Like, do you get a lot of that? Like you've got one kid who's in the business, but two others that aren't, and you're trying to figure out how do you be fair to all your children when only one is working with you? Yeah. I mean, that situation does come up for sure. Uh, The thing about those kinds of engagements are there's typically a team of advisors. So they're working with their, corporate lawyer. They're working with often a, a accountant that specializes in, in income tax and uh, maybe a financial planner as well. So we are more just involved in, in, in coming up with the value of the business. We don't often um, get involved in like the advisory side of things where we're, we're, we're coming up with a plan, but, but like typically with these kinds of situations, uh, we'll get a document that sets out the entire plan and it's all been thought through about, you know, who's going to get what, but um, yeah, there's probably a lot of difficult conversations and, and um, decisions mm-hmm. that need to be, be made before it gets to us to, to figure out how they're going to fairly allocate everything. And those things are also very driven by income tax uh, mm-hmm. issues. Like people want to defer income tax as long as possible. So that's, that's another huge, huge reason why those kinds of things get done. Do you look at like competition and like all those things, supply and demand, all these economic concepts? Do you use all that kind of stuff? Yeah, for sure. Because that's all part of determining the risk of the cash flow. So right. we, we've got the part where we forecast the cash flows, or, but then we've also got the part where we determine the risk. And so, yeah, that's all the the qualitative factors. You know, it, we often do, you know, a SWOT analysis like you, you would learn in uh, hmm. during your commerce degree, right? Uh, the, all those things are, are very relevant and it's, it's highly judgmental too. That's the other thing about our line of work is, uh, you could hire two evaluators, provide them with the exact same information and they're going to come up with two different values almost certainly. So hopefully they're close, but, um, they may not be. And so that's, uh, another kind of interesting part of our, our job is that, um, there's, there's not really a right answer. Uh, you have to be able to defend your position and explain why it makes sense. And there is some some science to it in terms of, uh, you know, determining discount rates based on a comparative investment in the stock market or something else. You know, you know what is the, the return that you would want on this private business compared to other things you could invest in? But um, but at the end of the day, there's there's a lot of subjectivity. Mm. Yeah, one of the, the the title of this chapter is Value Where Emotions and Economics Collide. And I think what's really interesting is that um, people often think about um, kind of economics in terms of hard nose, you know, money. But even in something like valuation, I mean, the easiest way to have a valuation is to sell the company because then you know what someone was willing to pay for it. Yeah. But you're doing valuation in a context where um, they don't want to sell the company, but they want to divide the assets. And that is highly emotional. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we could come up with the most measured, reasonable valuation, in our opinion. And the other side may say, no, that's that's not right. And I'm insulted. And, and, you know, I would say, well, tell me specifically why that's not right. But they may not do that. They They may just feel in their heart that that's unfair it's not right and Mm -hmm. so the dispute continues right but um yeah imagine like a long sorry go ahead imagine all these some of these uh, long term companies there's there's a emotional that goes back they don't say something that started in the 30s 
you know, some immigrant from the after the war, like there's emotional value that people feel like they need to get that out of it as well. Right. Like the history or the, I don't know. For yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, the other area where things can be used is in, in a merger, right? Where you have mergers and acquisitions where someone's buying out someone else and there it's not going on the open market. It's being bought out. Um, so, but in this case, you're, separating do you do any mergers like do we do any work where someone's trying to buy out somebody else and you're trying to figure out the value of that asset we do yeah so right now i've got a file ongoing where um where a, a son is a shareholder and his parents are also shareholders and he's going to be buying out their interest in the business so they you know are obviously on friendly terms and they just want to uh you know get this business moved into the hands of the son so um, we're going to come up with with a value, and um, they're going to use that to to transact. So we get involved in in that kind of thing. We do also have a separate M and A group that gets uh, more involved with like open market transactions. One thing that some people think is like, oh, you know, I'm selling my business. Um, I'll get a, a business valuation done, and then I'll just use that to to determine the price uh, that I transact at in the open market. But we typically advise against that. We're, we're certainly happy to help you come up with uh, the value of your company. But if you're going to the open market, we do not such suggest giving a CBV's report to the other side because that's kind of your low watermark. You want to get as much money as you can for your business. And so uh, that there's something that we actually have to articulate very clearly in our reports, which is there's a difference between price and value. We can determine the value of a business, but we can't determine the price at which it would actually transact in the open market because there's too many factors that we can't account for. Um, the Who the buyer is makes a huge difference. So um, if, you, if you take your uh, company to market, uh, there's couple, typically two different types of buyers that that might be interested. There's there's financial buyers, so someone like a, a private equity firm or or something who are looking at it sort of as a short term investment. Maybe they want to hold this company for five years. They want to make some changes, uh, and they then want to make an exit and sell sell their shares for more than they bought them for. Um, so that's one situation. Another situation is a strategic buyer, someone who you know, a competitor in that industry who thinks, you know, I can take this company and fold it into my company. I can eliminate a bunch of costs that would be duplicated and I can therefore increase the uh, the profit that's derived from that, that company. And so each different type of buyer is going to have their own kind Valuation. of model of, of yeah, what, what they think that they can yeah. do with this company. So the, the two different offers from those two different buyers could be widely different. Um, typically, you want to sell to the highest, which which might be a strategic buyer in a lot of cases. But um, for us to be able to determine that, we would have to know uh, what the strategic buyer's um, perception strategy of, is. Of, of, yeah, their strategy <laughs> and, and you know where they think they can save costs, how much cost they think they can save. And, and the other thing is no one's going to pay more than a nominal amount more than the lowest other bid. So, you know, if, if financial buyer bids a million, then strategic buyer is going to bid a million and one. And so unless there's two different strategic buyers to then get into a bidding war to then elevate the price higher, um, then you're not going to be able to realize those those synergies that they the strategic buyer is thinking they're going to get. It's like, um, sorry, I was just... <laughs> I was just thinking about this, like we were, t we talked about Joe Rogan as, you know, being like the podcast, you know, pinnacle. Yeah. I mean, he sold his, or he, he got 30 million for his podcast from Spotify, right? It's kind of an example. Well, it, it's, it's valuable, very valuable for Spotify to get Joe Rogan because um, just that'll up their reputation. Right. But so, they may never have got it from anybody else. Right. Uh, and to say, Oh, Joe Rogan's podcast is worth 30 million. Like, that's that's not something you'd be doing. <laughs> well, it is worth thirty million because somebody yeah, it paid worth, it, yeah. but it might not have been. No one else might have been willing to pay that, right? Uh, yeah. And, and so, yeah. So this book, the chapter in this book, is actually trying to distinguish between willingness to pay and what you actually pay. And mm -hmm. you know, someone might be willing to pay, you know, three million for something, and they buy it for one. So the exactly. value was really three million to them, but 
they only revealed what they actually paid, which was one. And sometimes you get sit, put into situations where you have to reveal your preferences. And that happens when you've got a bidding war. Now you actually have to, okay, you don't get to be coy anymore. You've, you've got a, what's it worth to you? Um, and, mm. and we're seeing that kind of in the real estate market where, you know, you'll have five or six bidders on a property and it goes like, you know, 50,000 over list. It's because suddenly they had to reveal their preferences because they knew there were competitors out there. Yeah. And the interesting thing about the real estate market, the residential market anyways, is that there's really no mathematical analysis you can do to justify your, your offer price. You just have to go with what you think you can get it for and what, what it's worth to you. Yeah. And maybe comparables, but some houses, like, there's just nothing like it. In the, yeah, no, and you don't know who's going to come out of the woodwork and offer $200,000 more than, than you do just because they want it and they have the money. Yes, yes. Yeah, wow, this was cool. Well, I think um, I really like how uh, it's kind of a business that is explicit about what we talk about in economics, which is value, willingness to pay, and price. And you're trying to get at that in a non-market system. But if there was a market system, it would be so much easier. Yeah, yeah, it would. And even just disclosure of, of yeah, what businesses are actually selling for, I guess that is a market. Um, yeah. That would make things a lot easier. In the U.S., there's more information available. It's not, it's still not that great uh, in terms of disclosure of private uh, transactions. And I totally identify with these people who don't want to disclose it. I mean, if I were selling a business, I probably probably wouldn't want to either. Um, but it, for our purposes, it would be nice if there was some way of getting uh, some more transaction data that we can use to. Ultimately, we'll probably still do more of a, more of an income type approach where we're looking at future cash flows and risk because no two businesses are the same. Uh, even supposed comparable companies are. You know, not really that comparable because every business has different product lines, different um, segments that they're involved in. And so to find one that's the two that are identical just doesn't happen. Um, but um, it certainly would be helpful for benchmarking the reasonability of, of valuations and probably eliminate some of the back and forth that happens between valuators where they're arguing over certain theoretical. Um, Matt, I, I forgot to ask you about, I don't, I don't know why I, change the topic, but I wanted to get your journey. Like I forgot to ask you about that, you know, your journey, what, what got you to this place from where you came from at University of Guelph? Sure. So um, I did uh, management economics and industry and finance at, at UOG and graduated in 2007. And from there, I went to Laurier for uh, three semesters and picked up a bunch of additional accounting classes that I didn't uh, take at Guelph. And uh, so that qualified me to um, go for my chartered accountant designation, as it was called at that time. So um, after graduating from Laurier, I went uh, to a firm, a CA firm in Brampton, and uh, it was just a mid-sized firm and worked there for three years with uh, the assurance, like, like um, accounting and auditing group, and uh, also doing a, a lot of corporate and personal tax, and just did the kind of the traditional uh, chartered accountant route and uh, achieved my designation there. And fairly early on, I realized that um, auditing was not uh, where my life story would, would unfold. Uh, it's kind of, a, in my view, a thankless task. A lot of people <laughs> do it and, and they, they enjoy it, but uh, I'm, careful. I'm gonna get a hot water with my colleagues here. But uh, anyways, I, I knew that uh, I, I didn't wanna do that. So I started looking at other avenues that would be um, complementary to my CA designation. And so uh, one thing I stumbled upon was, was the CBV designation and becoming a business evaluator. I didn't know anything about it at that time, but I started looking into it. And um, I had a friend who was had already done one of the, the courses. And uh, so she told me a bit about it. And it just seemed like a very nice um, combination of, of accounting, but also some finance. And uh, so I just started, I signed up for the courses and started taking them. And I thought, you know, this is interesting. And I learned more about the, the designation and the, the kind of work that people were doing with it. And it just, it seemed like, you know, a, a really nice area where mm -hmm. I could have a good career. So 
Um, then after doing a couple courses, I, I took a job uh, in the valuations group at, a, at another firm in uh, Hamilton. And I worked there for, I think, like four years in, in, in the valuations group, just doing um, exclusively valuations for for matrimonial purposes, uh, divorces, and shareholder disputes, and just kind of pure a pure valuations role. Uh, I worked very closely with, with a partner there who was a, a very good mentor to me and, and taught me a lot. And um, then uh, my wife got a job uh, offer in Winnipeg, uh, and it was very uh, a very good offer for, for her career. So we ended up moving out there for a couple of years, and I worked with uh, another firm out there doing valuations work, but also doing a bit of um, insurance work, which was um, mostly if like a business uh, has a fire or a flood and they have business interruption insurance, then uh, we would be hired by the insurance company to figure out how much profit the business lost uh, during the time that they were down so that the insurance company could could pay them the appropriate amount. And then uh, I think it's about two years ago now, I uh, moved back to Toronto and I started working with my, my present employer again in, in the valuations group. So your wife moved back too, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, she came with me. Luckily. <laughs> It's always good to know. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I think we're going to close off here. This was great. I, I, I don't know if you can, but um, and if you can't, just say you can't. Uh, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen in valuation where you go? That was uh, like a wild story. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit before and I was trying to come up with with some crazy stories. But in terms of the valuations, like it's it doesn't really get that crazy often. We are we as I said, we get involved in these divorces where there's a lot of emotions, but luckily for us, we we're kind of separated from that because we're the numbers guys and uh, you know, we if people start going off about things, we just say, "Okay, well, you better call your lawyer or, you know, your therapist because I I'm not uh, qualified <laughs> to help you with this." Uh, but yeah, I have like I've had had a couple instances where you know you're reading the background, the the pleadings of the case, or you know the transcripts of the two parties telling their stories, and there's a couple instances where there's been handguns involved, and you know just kind of like crazy situations that you read about in in, in the transcripts, and it's there's um, some interesting stuff. Yeah, I know. I when I, one time when I was young, I I used to I was unemployed, and I got so sick of looking for jobs, I went to the courts, just sat there. <laughs> And the stuff I saw is like, just sit in the court in Brampton. It was in Brampton, actually. Sit in the courts and you see like sword, or ceremonial swords and kids, <laughs> kids party. Oh, gosh. It was just in- anyways. So, exactly. Yeah. So those are always, you know, I, I don't want to say I get entertained by people's misfortunes. But, uh, yeah. you know, in terms of the, the documents I'm reviewing on a daily basis, those are definitely the most interesting ones. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the being the numbers person means you're looking at a lot of numbers and that yeah. can be a little bit more unemotional and you're just trying to help people get through to the next stage where they're going to move on with their lives and do whatever they need to do. That's right. Anyway, Matt, this was great. Um, it's, it's very cool to see how you've been able to take uh, two careers and put, put them together like accounting and finance and, uh, and create something that uh, turns out to be really meaningful to you. And, um, and I think what happens is, you know, students are often thinking about jobs in the future and, uh, it's always great to find someone who took a journey and in that journey ended up where they wanted to be. So that's great. Thanks a lot for joining us. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me. I really, thanks had so a good much, time. Matt.